We come together this morning with both joy and sadness in our hearts. We come together to celebrate and to mourn, to offer comfort to one another and to be fed by this sacred space, this ancient tradition of gathering on holy ground. We come together to give thanks for each other, for the gifts that we unexpectedly receive each day, for the light which is slowly beginning to return. We come together to worship, to pray, to cry, to sit in stillness, to sing. It's good to be together this morning. Hold fast to your light in the darkness, Hold fast to your light in the cold. Hold fast to your light when bitter winds of disbelief would extinguish it and waves of grief would overcome it. Hold fast to your light in that darkest hour until the silent cry is heard, the still small voice of hope the birth breath cry of the Redeemer, coming forth from the ashes of our discontent like the phoenix, coming forth from the loins of the great Mother Earth and every man, coming to us who wait beside the manger or who stand outside the school, coming to all who would believe there is always hope to all who would find that spark of light where no light was before. This time, while there is still time, we must find room at the inn, room for the fragile light of faith, the breath of hope, and the strength of forgiveness. In the everlasting prayer for peace and compassion, let us now sing out the ancient hymns into this dark night, holding high the blessed holy light of hope and faith. And in the promise that this light imparts, may we bless each other in our hearts. Amen. For our reading this morning, I offer you a story. It's a long one. I have edited it down a bit, but it's still long. But I think we could all use a story time right about now. A story from 1906 that many of you might know. The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. So snuggle into your pews and hear these words. One dollar and 87 cents, that was all. And 60 cents of it was in pennies. Three times Della counted it. One dollar and 87 cents. And the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl. So Della did which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles, with sniffles predominating. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with the powder rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only $1.87 with which to buy Jim a present. Many a happy hour she had spent planning for something nice for him, something fine and rare and sterling, something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. Suddenly, she whirled from the window and stood before the looking glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color. Rapidly, she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. 
Now there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her, rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee and made itself almost a garment for her. And then she did it up again nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. On went her old brown jacket, on went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with the brilliant sparkle still in her eye, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Sofroni, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran and collected herself, panting. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair, said Madame. Take your hat off and let's have a sight at the looks of it. Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said Madame, lifting the mass with a practiced hand. Oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings. Della was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not meretricious ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him, quietness and value. The description applied to both. $21 they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the 87 cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it only on the sly on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of a chain. When Della reached home, her intoxication gave way a little to prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love. Within 40 minutes, her head was covered with tiny, close-lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. At 7 o'clock, Della heard Jim's step on the stair away down on the first flight, and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit for saying little silent prayers about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, please God, make him think I'm still pretty. The door opened and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. He needed a new overcoat and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door as immovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed upon Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly with that peculiar expression on his face. Jim, darling, she cried, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you. You've cut off your hair? asked Jim. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. 
Don't you like me just as well anyhow? I'm me without my hair, ain't I? Jim looked about the room curiously. You say your hair is gone? He said with an air of almost idiocy. Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table. Don't make any mistake, Dell, he said, about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going a while at first. White fingers tore at the string and paper, and then an ecstatic scream of joy, for there lay the combs, the set of combs, side and back, that Della had worshipped long in a Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in the beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession, and now they were hers, but the tresses they should have adorned were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and smile and say, my hair grows so fast, Jim. And then Della leapt up like a little singed cat and cried, oh, oh, Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm. Isn't it a dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town for it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, he said, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. The Magi as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Oh, of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. My colleague, Reverend David Blanchard, makes a distinction between a present and a gift. He says, presents are the sort of things that fit on lists, complete with size and color preference. Presents are the sort of things we are smart enough to ask for. Gifts are altogether different. We don't usually think to ask for them, perhaps because we think we don't deserve them or don't want to risk expressing the need. Maybe we don't even recognize the need ourselves. Gifts differ from presents because no matter what form they take, they always represent something greater, something deeper, something more enduring. They are about things like love, respect, and affirmation. That's what I think about when I think about that classic story, The Gift of the Magi, the present was the watch chain, but the gift was the great respect 
that Della had for Jim, the pride she had in this man who was her husband, and her desire for him to be proud of himself, too. The present was the hair combs, but the gift was the great adoration that Jim had for Della, the amazement that this beautiful woman was his wife, and the desire for her to feel beautiful. It's a little heartbreaking, that story, each of them sacrificing so much to be so generous, and then that letdown when their presence can't be used. But it helps to think that although their presence couldn't be appreciated quite yet, their gifts could be. A lot of Christmas stories are bittersweet like that. I suppose that's fitting since the very first Christmas story of all begins with some heartbreak. Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem to pay their taxes. Mary is great with child. What an uncomfortable trip that must have been. And then when they try to seek shelter, they are turned away, even though it is clear that this woman is about to have a baby. They are turned away. There is no room in the inn. And so Mary and Joseph are forced to spend the night in a stable with the animals. But then comes the sweet part. Their son, Jesus, is born, and he is a healthy baby boy. And this baby, born in the lowliest place that can be, becomes a messenger of peace and justice and generosity. He becomes the hope of the world. And faced with that incredible hope, shepherds follow a star and the magi bring gifts to the manger. It's a bittersweet Christmas story. And so is this one that I clipped out of a local newspaper in New Hampshire years ago. Margaret Rondeau had written a letter to the editor to share her own experience of Santa Claus. Margaret was then working at the local high school, and she was struck that that year each of the classes in the high school was adopting a needy family in the area to make their Christmas wishes come true. She said, I often wonder if people realize how their kindness affects the lives of others. I know about this firsthand, she said, because I was one of those kids. Every holiday season brings back a lot of memories, good and bad. I was born to an extremely poor family, she says. There were too many Christmases when we didn't have the necessities, let alone toys. From a very early age, I knew that we were different. Most kids couldn't wait to go home, but home for my five brothers and myself was a scary place to be. I remember one particular Christmas, she says, when my mother had been hospitalized and my father was forced to work. My brothers and I were sent to some friend's apartment while our mother was gone. I was about six and was very anxious that Santa might not know how to find me. Christmas morning finally arrived. I had never seen such a pile of presents. Christmas was never like this at our house. My brothers and I were instructed to sit on the couch. We sat and watched our caretaker's children open their presents. And soon we realized that there were no presents for us. I was crushed. All I remember is my older brother begging me not to cry. To this day, I still cannot fathom why these people were so cruel. 
I remember thinking that I must have been a terrible little girl, for even Santa had deserted me. Two years later, Margaret and her brothers were orphaned. They were separated and her brothers were sent to another state. Margaret was left behind to endure life in orphanages, foster homes, and later a group home for teenage girls. The holidays became very lonely for her. Then when she was 16, Christmas changed for her again. A little of that magic of the season found its place back into her heart. She was living in a group home, and most of the girls were gone, spending the holiday with some family. Margaret and the other girls who had nowhere to go were asked to make out a wish list. These girls were teenagers. They'd had a rough life, and they had low expectations of Christmas. The holiday was really only for little kids, they all said. Not wanting to be disappointed once again, they never filled out what they really wanted. They just asked for small things like books and board games and, of course, makeup. Unbeknownst to Margaret, though, one of the staff members added an item to her wish list, which was read aloud on a local radio station. Christmas morning, Margaret was surprised to see a big, beautifully wrapped present with her name on it. Convinced that some mistake had been made, she reluctantly opened it, revealing the most beautiful record player she had ever seen. Overwhelmed, she started to cry. Margaret says, I never knew who my secret Santa was, but at that moment, I finally knew that I wasn't alone. Someone actually cared that I was alive. That was the most precious gift of all. The present was the record player, the gift was feeling for the first time in a long time that she had a place in this world, that someone cared for her, and that she was not alone. It's a bittersweet Christmas story. And so is this one. Forty years ago, Nancy Gavin's husband, Mike, had lost his Christmas spirit. In fact, he hated Christmas. Not the true meaning of Christmas, but the commercial aspects of it. The overspending, the frantic running around at the last minute. The gifts given in desperation because you couldn't think of anything else. And then one day, shortly before Christmas, their son Kevin, who was 12 that year, had a junior wrestling match at his school. It was a non-league match against a team sponsored by an inner city church. These youngsters dressed in sneakers so ragged that shoestrings seemed to be the only thing holding them together presented a sharp contrast to Kevin's team in their spiffy blue and gold uniforms and sparkling new wrestling shoes. As the match began, Nancy and Mike were alarmed to see that the other team was wrestling without headgear, a kind of light helmet that is designed to protect a wrestler's ears. It was a luxury the ragtag team obviously could not afford. It didn't go well for the inner city team. Kevin's school took every weight class. But as each of their boys got up from the mat, he swaggered around in his tatters with false bravado, a kind of street pride that couldn't acknowledge defeat. 
Mike, seated beside his wife, shook his head sadly. I wish just one of them could have won, he said. They have so much potential, but losing like this could take the heart right out of them. Mike loved kids, all kids, and he knew them, having coached Little League, football, baseball, and lacrosse. And that's when the idea for his present came. That afternoon, Nancy went to a local sporting goods store and bought an assortment of wrestling headgear and shoes and sent them anonymously to the inner city church. On Christmas Eve, she placed an envelope on the Christmas tree at home, the note inside telling Mike what she had done and that this was his gift from her. His smile was the brightest thing about Christmas that year. And from that night on, each Christmas she followed the tradition, one year sending a group of kids with special needs to a hockey game, another year a check to a pair of elderly brothers whose home had burned down the week before Christmas, and on and on. The envelope became the highlight of Christmas, the last thing opened on Christmas morning as their children, ignoring their new toys, stood in wide-eyed anticipation as their dad lifted the envelope from the tree to reveal its contents. Ten years later, Mike died of cancer. When Christmas rolled around, Nancy was still so wrapped in grief that she barely got the Christmas tree up. But Christmas Eve found her placing an envelope on the tree. And in the morning, she awoke to find not just her envelope there, but three others. Each of her children, unbeknownst to the others, had placed an envelope on the tree for their dad. They understood that the envelope didn't contain just a present. The envelope contained a gift, the reclaiming of Christmas spirit, the reclaiming of the true meaning of Christmas, that full of the hope that a newborn baby can bring to this world, we are also called to bring more peace and justice and generosity into our living. On Christmas this week, we are called not just to give presents, but also gifts. And we are called to be grateful, not just for the presents we receive, but for the gifts that we are given every day, all year long. Gifts of love, respect, and affirmation. And we are called to use our personal gifts to work for peace and justice, and to fill this world with hope. In the days and weeks to come, may we answer this calling. Amen. Blessed be and Merry Christmas.